And over at Two Minute Tennis, we're gonna have a fun time here going live, answering your tennis questions. We're gonna go over technique, strategy, footwork. I'm gonna give you some ideas here in single strategy, and then it'll buy us some time until we get, uh, we get some people commenting uh, and asking questions. So let's talk about something really, really uh, important when it comes to single strategy. And that is when your opponent comes to the net. So let's say you're playing and you hit a short ball and it pulls your opponent in. When you hit a short ball, and feel free to ask any questions if you have any, and I'll answer them live here. When you give your opponent a short ball and they attack, what would you say is the shot that you should hit? And you really can put the answers that people give. What's up, everyone? Thank you so much uh, for joining. Uh, we got 30 people in the house, but we've got one like. I always like to try to get those likes as close to the number of people who are on here as possible. It brings more people in, so thank you so much. Let's say your opponent's coming forward. What shot, and go ahead and answer below. Hello from Germany, hello, hello. Uh, I'm not the only one immediately, <laughs> like, thank you so much, Leo. So the first shot, the first shot, I call this the two shot passing shot strategy and Corey, very smart because that's actually the second shot I would recommend. But the first shot I would recommend is right to them. So let's de uh, deconstruct this. I love lobs. I, I, absolutely. Ab Richard. Hey, Richard, you were here the other day. Thank you so much for being here. So we have some people saying at the feet. We've got some people saying lobs. We've got some people saying down the line passing shot. So you can actually put those two into categories. Involve the approacher in the point. Avoid the approacher. Either hit it to them or hit it away from them. What I'll tell you is hit it right to them. See, when your opponent comes to the net off of an approach shot, a couple things occur. First, you're in trouble, right off the bat. If you're not in major trouble, you're in a little bit of trouble. And if even if you're not in a little bit of trouble, you're at least neutral. You're certainly not offensive when your opponent is attacking. Because you got a short ball, you gave them a short ball. They're the ones coming forward. And can everyone just give me a, a thumbs up? I notice when I'm live on Instagram and I get a phone call, it all gets like robotic and people think that I've turned into a, a robot. So can you just give me a thumbs up to make sure that you can all hear me uh, well and that the sound is, is good at the moment? When your opponents come into the net, don't avoid them. Because when you avoid them, when you're in trouble, you tend to hit the net, you tend to hit out. And when you lob, you tend to hit long. Uh, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the, the confirmation that you can hear me with that. I, I always get telemarketer calls, and no matter if I, um, if I uh, block that number, then they call with a new number. It's so frustrating. So the ball should be hit right to their feet. Now, right off the bat, half the time they're going to miss that. Hello from Brazil. Thank you so much for joining. Half the time when you just hit the ball right to them, they are, what's up, City of Brass? What's going on? My gosh, that's awesome. I'm usually seeing you uh, in, in other places as well. But when you hit the ball right to their feet, they're most likely not going to split step, and they're going to miss half of those. The other half, they're going to pop the ball up, and now you get to come forward. Now, somebody already mentioned, this is when you want to go for the down-the-line passing shot. It's called the two-shot passing shot strategy. When your opponent comes to the net, hit it low down the middle, right over the net. Hello from Pakistan, awesome. Then this is where you go for the down the line passing shot. You will win. Uh, oh, I'm a little glitchy. Dang it, I'm a little glitchy. Uh, that's how it works, that's how it works. When your opponent comes to the net, I want you hitting the ball low to them and then on your second shot going for the down the line pass. Now, let's say your opponent comes to the net on you and you are not in trouble. Hey, what's up, Eric Fan, who just became, oh, it's out of sync, that's all. Dang it, well, let's do this. You know what I'm gonna do? I am going to, I'm gonna stop this live. I'm gonna stop it, because I don't want it to, to make people like weirded out by the sound and everything. I'm gonna stop the live and I want you to join me, all right? I'm gonna stop this right now, I'm not gonna post it. 
I'm gonna stop it and then I'll go live again. So give me a couple seconds just to reset it and start it all back. Oh, is it back? Am, oh, it's good? Is my voice good? Great, great, great. Thank you so much. No glitch, awesome. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, we made it through. We made it through, thank you, Arthur, I appreciate it. So let's say you're gonna go for a passing shot. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate everyone telling me that. By the way, we got 42 people here and I've only got 16 likes. I would love to get those likes up closer to the number of people here. So I'm gonna give you three choices if you're gonna go for a cross court passing shot. And I want you to tell me where you should make the ball land on a cross court passing shot because this makes or breaks the success you have with a cross court pass. Ready? So your opponent's coming in off an approach shot and you're gonna go for a pass. I'll give you three choices. Uh, we'll make them these colors. Should you make the ball land by the blue, by the red, or by the green? Which one, your opponent's up, you're gonna go for a cross court pass. Which one do you think you should go for? Blue, red, green. Where should you be trying to make your cross court passing shot Land, big hug from Italy, thank you so much. All right, we got green, awesome. We got somebody saying green, blue, we got two blues. I would say blue, there you go, City of Brass. Blue, all right, Halil says blue. The question is, your opponent comes to the net and you're gonna go for a cross court passing shot. We've got green, this is green, right? This is green. You want your ball to land on the blue. And here's the reason why. What you will not see in junior, adult tennis, collegiate, pros, you will not see cross-court passing shots land super deep. And the reason is, in order for a ball to land deep, it has to pass right next to the net player. The only way to get a cross-court passing shot to really go by the net player is to make the ball land near what I call the side T, right? It's, this, it's not this T, it's this T, it's the side T. Now, what does that require? What does that require that you do? It requires that you put a lot more spin on the ball. So you can have a, a little bit of more of an air target, but it's not so much that it's going higher over the net. You can actually try to make the ball peak on your side <laughs> and then it descends as it's crossing the net. But have you ever hit a cross court passing shot wide, right? So you make the ball land here when you hit a cross court pass. So you're here and you try to hit a cross court pass and the ball lands in the middle of uh, the doubles alley. But guess what? The ball didn't. Hello from the Netherlands, amazing. The ball didn't land long, I'm sorry, uh, wide, if you hit a cross-court passing shot and it lands in the doubles alley. The ball landed long. If you could have made the ball land shorter when you go for a cross-court pass, then your ball will then land in the service box. Cross-court passing shots need to land in the service box. Let me repeat. I want you to try to hit cross-court passing shots that land in the service box. So what does this mean? When you hit down the line, you can make the ball land here, 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 here. You can make the ball land anywhere. But when you're gonna hit a cross court pass, the ball's gotta land short. This is when you see people finish up here on a cross court passing shot. So it's important that you don't just think, oh, down the line and cross court. They're the same shot, just different directions. They're not. You can really spin this ball to get the the result that you're looking for. So swing up the back of the ball, get that ball to go over. Amazing, hello from Scotland. Everyone, just tell me where you're from, by the way. We got Scotland in the house, we've got Costa Rica, we got Netherlands, amazing. I know that we have Brazil and Germany here and Italy. Is anybody from the United States, right? And I'm sure you're all Eagles fan. Hello from New York, I'm not too far from you. Probably two hours. Uh, I'm about an hour north of Philadelphia. What's up, Mexico, we got India. This is amazing. London, what's up everyone? So I want you to be better when your opponent is coming forward. 
because when your opponent's coming forward, if you're smart about the shots that you go for, hello from Ottawa, Canada, Florida, amazing. Hi, Lenora, amazing. Uh, I'm gonna be in Florida at the beginning of uh, April. I'm going to, hello, for, hello from India, um, amazing. I'm going with Gigi Fernandez and Peter Freeman. Uh, we're gonna be doing the uh, Tennis Con Live. And it's at Innisbrook, which I believe is like 30 minutes from Tampa. Really excited for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them up. They could be technique. I'll, I'll like turn the camera and I'll demonstrate here in the basement. Um, we could do footwork. We could do strategy. We can do serve, forehand, backhand. Uh, there's a 14-year-old. I just saw Functional Tennis on Instagram post a video and... It was on a 14-year-old kid, this kid's one-handed backhand, I mean, <laughs> uh, I heard somebody talk about Djokovic's two-hander, uh, saying that it was cleaner than after he washed his hands for 20 seconds. This kid's one-handed backhand, incredible. We got South Carolina and Canada here. So if you have any questions, just let me know. By the way, you know what this is all about. Give me one second here. You all know what this is, right? The birthday hat. Uh, this, this is, uh, East Coast from Canada. Amazing. Please go, like, for my money, Target has the best birthday hats. Uh, yeah, you saw that kid, right? Gino? Amazing, right? That one-handed backhand. So, Gino, what I love, and then I'll talk about the birthday hat here. Let, let's, uh, let's turn the camera here. When, when that kid hits, I think his name's Maxi or Max, uh, attacking an easy serve. That's a great question. One thing that I love about that Max kid who was on functional tennis on Instagram, he turned like this. You watch so many players and their racket is wide open. But the racket being straight up and down is so important for making sure that you then close your racket face. Now, a closed racket face, in my opinion, of all the things I could teach, the birthday hat, the split step, you know, whatever it is, it, volley technique, overhead technique, doubles and single strategy on the strategy board. A closed racket face prior to hitting the ball, which is when your strings are facing slightly down, doesn't have to be straight down, just slightly down, is one of the top four tips you can ever add to your game. Tilting the strings down allows you to swing up the back of the ball for topspin. When your racket is straight up and down like this, and you could balance a coin on the edge, that's what leads to players opening up the racket and the racket goes like this at contact. This is why beginners always hit the ball out <laughs> and like over the fence because they think, oh, I want my racket straight up and down like a knife going through butter. Problem is then the racket's open when they hit the ball and the ball goes sailing out and they're like, oh, they're playing baseball. What they don't know to do is tilt the strings down so they can spin up the back of the ball. So back to that kid, Maxi, his racket is so straight up and down that it makes it so easy for him to close the racket face. Many recreational players, many pros, the racket is so wide open that as the racket falls, it only gets to square. And then when they hit the ball, they've got to supinate and they got to try to square up the racket a different way. So I was super impressed with that kid's uh, one hit of backhand. So I think I will be using uh, his technique in a, in a few days from now to make a, a YouTube video. I'll have to message him and say, hey, do you mind if I... I, you know, I promote your channel, you know, on YouTube or Instagram, TikTok. Let's talk about the birthday hat, because in my opinion, the birthday hat is the single best way to get rid of a waiter's tray serve. Now, I want to explain something before I go through the technique. Not all pros have the birthday hat motion, and that's fine. You look at my favorite player of all time, Sampras. You look at Shapovalov. Shapo's not hitting the birthday hat. And if I were his coach, I wouldn't be teaching him the birthday hat. But when you are in a waiter's tray position, the way to fix it is to learn the birthday hat drill, which is a circular movement where the racket passes in over your head and knocks off the birthday hat. Pros who hit the birthday hat, Osaka, Kyrgios, Sam Groth, Djokovic, Federer, these are play, uh, 
J.J. Wolf, like all day long, J.J. Wolf. If he wore a birthday hat, he would hit the birthday hat every time. When you move the rocket in over the head in this circular motion, the rocket speed that comes from it is incredible. Now, there is one more technique that I would recommend. And guys, if you haven't hit the like button, please do only because we're at 67 viewers and only 34 likes. I would love to get it all the way up there. So please hit that like button if you're enjoying this live. Thank you so much. When you look at Felix Auger Aliassim, Felix, as the rocket comes in over the head and his elbow drives up and he makes this move, he's in this position. The strings that hit the ball are actually facing down. So the tip I would actually give you, if you're someone who goes into the waiter's tray, would be to wear a birthday hat and then hit the back of the racket. So I'm gonna kneel right now because I am too tall in the basement and I will put a hole in the ceiling. So check this out. I want you to hit the birthday hat on your serve and then hit the back of the racket as a drill to learn how to use the circular swing and then come up supinated. Even if you hit the birthday hat, you can still open up too early. So the fix for that is to get into the John Isner or Felix Auger Aliassime position where they normally go up and then they turn and they pronate and they hit the, you know, the correct side of the strings. But I got to thinking, I was like, hey, why don't I just have my students just for a drill and just for the kicks and the fun of it, how about we just have them hit the back of the racket against the ball? And what that does is it teaches the brain two things. One, how to get the racket to pass in over the head and circle around. And second, how to not go into the waiter's tray. So if you can, if you're a coach, add those two ideas. Uh, let me see here. There we go. All right, thank you so much. All right, so here's how it works. If you have any questions, write, it up, uh, write them down right now. I'm going to see what we got here. Yo, Ryan, what's the best place to stand in singles at the baseline rally? Like I see Alcrest over stand way back while Federer stands up close. Yeah, okay, so here's the thing. The only reason you've got to stand really far back uh, is if your opponents are absolutely blasting the ball. So you can stay, stand closer up. And Federer, Federer is someone, you know, you watch him, he's an all-court player. So when you watch Federer, he is trying to go forward. Like Federer, in Federer's career, and let's see how well you all know my instruction and, and what I've been doing here on Two Minute Tennis on my channels. Do you know what Federer's winning percentage is back here? Do you know what Federer's winning percentage is? Take a guess in Federer's 20 plus year career, what percentage of the points Federer won when he stayed behind the baseline? Take a wild guess. What percentage of these points did Federer win? Uh, if he stepped inside the court and won the point up here, those points are not included in this stat. It's just when he stays behind the baseline. Can I do all type down below and give me what percentage of the points Roger Federer won when he, when he was behind the baseline? We got 55, that's a very smart guess, by the way. Uh, 52, 34, 70, 55, 50, 55, 50, 34, or I'm sorry, 30 to 40, 50, 55. I like it, I like it. The answer, and Eric Fan, you are the winner. You are the closest. The answer is 47%. So hear me out on so that we, I wanna make sure I'm making myself very clear. In Roger Federer's entire career, make sure you hit that like button, guys. Thank you so much. In Roger Federer's entire career, if you just take the points where he stayed behind the baseline, he only won 47% of those points of when he stayed behind. The, it means he lost 53. That is not a winning percentage. So how did he win matches if, he, if he's losing more points than he's winning? It's because, yes, <laughs> you're like, wait, that's it? That's all he won? Yes, because when he goes to the net, he's winning 70% of those points. See, the, when you watch Federer, 
Federer is, you know, like the players pick on their backhand. Federer is trying to figure out how to get to the net. Yes, Michelle. Federer is trying to figure out how to go forward. With that one-hander, especially, you know, kind of middle of his career where he just was hanging too far back and everyone just bombing his backhand. Then what happens is he started having a little bit of a drought because he couldn't get to the net because he's hanging back too much. And then all of a sudden we saw kind of in the twilight of his career, his record against Nadal was ridiculous over the past couple of years because now he gets to, he was starting to stand a little bit closer and trying to get to the net. So to win a match 6-3, 6-3 or 6-3, 6-2, the average winning percentage of the entire match when it comes to points is 55 to 45. If you've ever won a match, 6-2, 6-2, 6-2, you won 55% of the points. That's the number you want to get to to like dominate the match and just have it be that you're guaranteed to win. So if Federer's only winning 47% of the points back here, he obviously had to be going to the net where enough, where it's like a weighted, like have you ever taken a test and you've bombed the test, <laughs> and you're like, oh no, like this is not good. Um, if, if, you, if you do badly on a test in school that's weighted a lot, you've gotta do really well on quizzes and the homework and participation to counteract that bad grade. It's the same thing. Most points are played staying behind the baseline, so you have to get to the net enough so that your high winning percentage brings that 47 up to a 55. See how that works? All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, likely not on his serve as a stat. No, that is all of them. <laughs> that is every single point where he stayed behind the baseline. Um, hi, hey, Ryan, curious in your thoughts regarding Patrick's approach about left eye. I think it's a bunch. I, I, think, I think when you don't have much to teach, then that's what you go to. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of Patrick and his teaching. I, I think he doesn't help many people. I think when you, when you put him with players who I coach and it's like not world-class athletes and it's just like normal tennis players like myself, uh, I'm not a pro tennis player. I don't pretend to be a pro tennis player. I think that's when you can kind of get exposed as a coach. I'm not firing any shots. I'm answering a question because if I, I, I could lie to you and I could say, um, I think he's awesome, but then I would, I wouldn't be being honest. I'm always going to be honest with you. I, I don't think he's very knowledgeable when it comes to actually helping tennis players who are normal people. I think he's great with a pro. I think he's awesome with the pros. But who's watching his channel? Not pros. And they're like, oh, and they're, oh I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to do that. And all of a sudden it's, you know, he's telling people that the way you determine if you should use a closed stance or open stance is based on which eye is dominant. Like I, I, I it, what determines open stance is close, open stance and closed stance is the height of contact, among other things. But let's just speak right from the heart here, like like just not from the heart, but like straight shooter. The way you determine contact, the uh, open stance, closed stance is the height of the ball. That's it. The higher the contact, the more open. The lower the contact, the more closed. Yeah, you got it. I'm just being. Somebody asked me the question. I didn't come on here talking about Patrick. And by the way, Patrick has no idea who I am. Uh, best way to get comfortable with a continental grip. So this is an interesting thing. This is an interesting topic. I think the worst thing that is taught, um, and I think the USPTA, um, USPTA, PTR, LTA, the Australian tennis, whatever, I think they do a real disservice to uh, tennis players by teaching that the continental grip is for everything other than the forehand. I think that is absolutely ridiculous. I think the number one reason why people stink at volleying is because they use the one grip system. In my opinion, the one grip system has destroyed tennis because people don't like volleying, especially backhand volleys, and because players really struggle. And I'm not talking about the pros, and, but I will tell you this, the, uh, the like Roger Federer, like you watch the pros, the backhand volleys, it, it, you watch Tsitsipas hit a backhand volley. Whew, wow. Uh, they're, they're struggling. And it's all the one grip system. And it's all under the guise that you don't have enough time to change your grip. What a bunch of baloney. Whenever somebody tells me that they don't have enough time to change their grip, I instantly know that they've never tried it. You can tell me, Ryan, I've tried the two grip system. I've tried the one grip system. 
I've tried using one grip on the forehand and backhand. I've tried the two grip system on the forehand and backhand volley. And I've tried them out and I've just decided that I'm gonna do a one grip system. That I can respect, like I, that's amazing, great. Use the one grip system. But for recreational players, you've got doubles players on the ad side. The ball's going from ad side to ad side. They wanna poach so badly and they hate their backhand volley. That's if they're right-handed. And they, and they won't do it because they don't use the grip system to help square up the racket. So let's, let's talk about this because we're talking about the continental grip. Uh, somebody asked, how do I become more confident and comfortable using a continental grip? What I would tell you is stop using it so much. <laughs> the continental grip is not your best friend. Let's talk about volleys for a second. The reason players chop on their volley, especially the backhand, and I love when coaches put the racket over the net and they go like this and they have somebody hand toss them the ball and they're going like this and they're trying to teach them to go forward. But have you noticed the racket's wide open when that happens? They move like this, the ball goes up off the racket and then the coach catches. Well, if you're volleying and that ball's going up off your racket, that ball's going out. So that drill doesn't really help. So here's what you actually wanna do. Instead of trying to not chop, watch my racket, change the grip slightly, and look what happens to the racket now. The racket squares against the back of the ball, whether it's a low ball, a medium ball, a high ball. If you change your grip slightly past a continental for your backhand volley, and then you're slightly shy of a continental on your forehand volley, what ends up happening is you're squaring up the racket against the back of the ball. Now I've had discussions with former Grand Slam, you know, or Grand Slam champions saying, I cannot, you know, texting me, I cannot believe you're teaching a two grip system. The idea, back a hundred years ago, Bill Tilden would not believe that we are using two different grips on the ground strokes. You don't have time to, a hundred years ago, if this were 1923, he would be like, you gotta be kidding me. You, Ryan, you use one grip, forehand and backhand. Close stance, everything. Don't you dare hit a two-handed backhand. The first person who taught a two-handed backhand might as well have been a heretic. My, it, it's blasphemous to teach a two-handed backhand a hundred years ago. Now, it's like the preferred method. So I don't know, maybe in a hundred years, Vic Braden will finally be understood. And that's where the two grip system comes from. But if you are struggling with your backhand volley, change your grip. You have plenty of time to do it. Don't tell me that you don't. And don't let any coach ever tell you that you don't have enough time to change your grip because all they're telling you is that they've never tried it either. All right, let's see what questions we got here. Uh, reach up about the bottom hand float and adjust each volley. Yes, daily tennis channel. Yep, I love it. Uh, okay, elbow position on the forehand. Are you talking about this? Are you talking about elbow? Are you talking about the, this? Are you talking about contact? What do you mean by the elbow position of, of Djokovic? Uh, especially back here, I, I absolutely agree with you on that. Yeah, yeah, Patrick, I mean, He's the ooh -la, I call him the ooh -la -la coach. Uh, I, sp I, I only speak one language, which means I don't know as much as him. <laughs> if you can speak seven languages and start parfait, da -la, da -la, all of a sudden people are like, oh, he's amazing. Uh, my nine-year-old uh, breaking multi-synthetic in a week, under 10 hours, should I go? I, I would be very careful about going to a poly with a nine-year-old. Very, very careful. You, I'd rather you get the stringalings that Sampras put between the strings to keep them from rubbing and keep a softer string rather than going to a hard string like a poly. Uh, yeah, and the prep. Yeah, I was taught that in the 60s for volley. Sorry for the caps. <laughs> no problem. You're allowed to have caps. I just feel like I'm getting yelled at, Scooter. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, the, 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 elbow, the elbow up. See... Let's talk about volleys here because the elbow on the ground stroke can be used for the elbow on the volleys. So let's check, oh, I don't know why I'm pulling this out. I was pulling out the Top Spin Pro. Let's talk about the elbows. What is the fix? Let's talk about this. What is the fix? Oh, I'll tell you why more players do not utilize uh, the, 
uh, the drop shot. It's very easy to know. And all you have to do is watch Alcaraz and see how he's able to do the, uh, uh, the, the, the drop shot. So let's talk about the elbows. When you hit a volley, if you take your racket back too far, if you turn and you go like this, what is the fix? All you coaches, what is the fix for a backswing? You see a player like this. What's the fix for this? And you see this all the time. The player does this. This is a problem. What is the fix for a racket that is too far back on a forehand volley? What is the fix? <laughs> Richard, you're not supposed to get the answer right right away. <laughs> Elbows out. Look at you! Sweets and Dandy. I remember Sweets and Dandy a couple days ago when I was live before. Getting all the answers right. Look at you. Man. This is awesome. By the way, we got 97 people on here. Come on. Let's see if we can get to 100. Oh, okay. Now, here's an interesting thing. So this is what I was waiting for. Tuck the elbow in. Or the, or the elbow and have a tennis ball. The, the racket, I have a tennis ball in my armpit and the elbow is still back. Or the racket is still, still back. The fix is elbows out away from you. Elbows out. Now watch this. Watch my hand. You tell me if my hand moves. You ready? Did my hand move? No. My hand is staying in the exact same place. All I'm doing is taking my elbow and pushing it out. What I tell my students is, if you're taking a lesson with me, I should be able to smell your armpits. When you're hitting volleys, I wanna smell your armpits. What's taught is elbows in. What's taught is keep your elbows in. The problem is a low elbow, just like a waiter's tray serve, this position has the racket back. The way to fix it is the Vic Braden, keep your elbows out. So if you're someone who's been told to, uh, that you've been told that your backswing is too large on your volley, the fix is to get your elbows out. Now this is what you typically see. You typically see coaches take students to the fence. And what they'll do is they'll have them stand here and not hit the wall, not hit the fence. So you hit me the ball and I hit volleys. And that's great and that's effective. And it can give them the feeling of not hitting the fence. The problem is until you push this elbow out and it's kind of like you're at a wedding and like I'm escorting my wife like down the aisle, whatever. Right? Like you want the elbow out. When you have that, all of a sudden when you turn, now your backswing's not too big. It's when your elbow drops. So don't, when you're at the net, don't have your elbows in because that's when you'll take big swings. Have your elbows out. And then when you turn, the racket face is against the back of the ball. You couple that with changing your grip, holy smokes. That's gonna make a world of difference. Okay, let's see here. I was waiting for your IG live. Well, it's Saturday. So I remember I pick up my kids on Saturday, on uh, Monday through Friday from school. Uh, but Saturday, I'm going to go live, especially because I've, I've got some of them running with my website, which I'll tell you in a second here. Uh, okay, so here's, let's talk about the Alcaraz and the, and the drop shot. So have you ever noticed that when Alcaraz hits a drop shot, it like, it, it's like it works every time? How is that? Uh, elbows in front, absolutely. You want the elbow in front of the shoulder. But you don't want elbow in front because you can have your elbow in front and your hand in front and the racket back. The fix is elbow in front of the, this is for the big swing on the volley someone just mentioned. Your ready position, the elbow is in front of your shoulder, but elbow's out. But when you turn, the elbow's gonna be what's back. It's not elbow in front because then elbow in front, it, it's, it produces this. It, there's gotta be a reason why it's, it's, everywhere. Keep your elbows in. Keep your elbow, you know, go forward to the volley. Well, then why are players doing this? If they were just told to have the elbows out in the ready position, then the backswing would, wouldn't be big. So when you watch Alcaraz, where do, where with his drop shots, where are his opponents standing? Because that's really giving you the, the information on how to hit an effective drop shot. By the way, thank you so much. We're at 94. We got 59 likes. If you're watching this and you haven't smashed that like button, please do so right now. Let's see if we can get to 75 likes in one minute. Let's get to 75 likes. One minute from right now, we're going to be at 75 likes. So this is Alcaraz, all right? Let's say this is Alcaraz. His opponents stand way back. 
That's the key to his success on the, the drop shot. See, when we think of drop shots, and I'm speaking for, for myself, I'm not a pro tennis player. I maxed out at a 5.0 level, uh, you know, on, on the NT bar P scale. I was, I'm too young. Look, look at that, we're already at 72. Come on now, we can get, we can get to 100, or we can get it. Oh, we already had 100 people in here? Great, I was, I was busy talking. The reason Alcaraz is so successful with his drop shot is because he pushes uh, uh, yeah, it's not too bad, Stephen. It's, I'm, I'm no pro tennis player. I never pretend to be. Uh, it's not too shabby. That's a good way to say it. I don't stink at tennis. That's a good way to say it. With Alcaraz's opponent so far back, he steps in and then he goes for the drop shot. So here's my piece of advice for you if you're trying to get to, look at that, we got to 78, 78 uh, a, uh, uh, likes. The way to, to have more success with your drop shot is to push the opponent back. Now, you and I do not hit the ball as hard as Alcaraz. So our opponents are not standing as far back. So they're not respecting us as much, right? So what we have to do, instead of crushing the ball, we wanna hit some higher and deeper balls. You have to figure out, how can I push my opponent back to the fence? How do I push it back against, how do I push him back? And if you can push your opponent or her, when you push your opponent back, that's when your drop shot doesn't have to be as good. You don't have to be great at drop shots if your opponent is all the way back at the fence. So do whatever you can to push your opponent back. Once you move them back, that's when you can go for the drop shot. And then they come barreling in, they probably miss. You wanna be inside the court if they barely get to that ball because there are two situations in tennis where you wanna copy what your opponent hit and you want a drop shot, a drop shot, and you want to lob a lob. So when you get a drop shot, you typically want a drop shot back. If, you're a po if you stay back, you're not gonna get that. So you want to come up when you hit a drop shot. They come up, you come up into no man's land, and you react to what they're gonna do. Let's see here, 82 likes, I'm loving it. Any tips for an angle volley? Absolutely. Okay, so first off, when you're hitting an angle volley, so let's say you're right here, the, the opponent hits down the line, and you're here. Understand what an angle is. So an angle is a ball that leaves the court using the single sideline. An angle is a ball that is leaving the court using the single sideline. So the ball is going this way. It is leaving the court using the sideline. And the best way to do that is to make the ball land in the service box. The mistake players make, which causes them to not be able to hit great angle volleys, is that players try to hit deep volleys to end the point. Deep volleys are great, except your opponent's gonna get to that ball because it's a shorter distance. So what you're better off doing when you have a first volley, or maybe the ball's low, is to hit the ball deep. Then by yourself time, then, when you get the opportunity, volley short. Oh, Gino, I'm so glad you love that strategy. Yeah, volley, ang angle volleys should land in the service box. So someone asked about how do you practice at home? Can somebody, can you guys see my messages? AJ, yes. <laughs> Let's see here. How do I hit a, a, a volley, a big forehand at the net in doubles? That's my weak point. How do I volley a big forehand? All right, yeah. I'm telling you, best way to, uh, to practice ground strokes at home, I just saw somebody hit. So let's talk about the ground strokes at home. And that is the Top Spin Pro. So guys, I am an affiliate. If you would like to use my link, it would mean the world to me and my family if you used my link to get a Top Spin Pro. But if you're looking for simple ways to, or a simple way to just practice your technique at home. And it's not just, I gotta make sure I don't hit the ceiling. It's not just for standing still, like you can put it in the driveway, right? Put it outside in the driveway and then just work on your mogul stance and work on the crossover, split, mogul, and crossover, split, mogul, crossover, split, mogul, and crossover. So it's, a way that you can incorporate movement with split step, with footwork, with the technique, with topspin. 
So just uh, send me an email, ryan at two minute tennis.net, and I'll throw you my link. It would mean the world to me. Or just go to any video here on YouTube. Yeah, it's awesome, AJ. Uh, just if you would like AJ, it would mean the world to me. It would take you a little bit of work, but send me an email, ryan at two minute tennis.net. And just say, hey, Ryan, where's the link? And I'll throw it right to you. Or message me in Instagram. I'm always, on the, I'm always checking my DMs. My, my DMs always explode after things like this. <laughs> and all of a sudden, people are asking me questions. All right, let's see here. Shadow swinging. So I did a ton of shadow swinging. What's nice about the Topspin Pro, it's $150. The customer service is ridiculous. I had the same ball on it for two years and I finally had to get a new one. It was like 10 bucks or something. Um, they're in London. The owners are amazing. Uh, so, so it's great. I am 68 and I'm always getting beaten by, by framed, muffed, or intentional short slices shots. I've been told to make a court position a couple steps inside the baseline. Okay, but dang, really? Look, if you're constantly getting beaten by those shots, that really is the solution. Because if you're not struggling with the deep shots, because if the ball comes deep to you, you can take a ball off the rise with a little half volley. Or if it's a floater, then you can come in and take the ball out of the air. It's no different than someone who's got like a really great angle on their serve. If you're playing double, if you're playing singles or doubles, and someone's got a really sharp angle, well, you've got to stand farther in to cut that shot off. So standing farther in is going to help you deal with those shots. Uh, very nice, your details about the one-handed backhand. Mine's getting better since I saw your demonstration. Thanks. Um, that was uh, a, a subscriber's tourney. Oh, I love it. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Um, guys, real quick, because I do have to run, but since I was on here for 41 minutes, I would love it if you just gave me 41 seconds. For the next 35 hours, it's when the Super Bowl ends because... I, my Philadelphia Eagles are in the Super Bowl. I'm running a special for my premium membership. The premium membership is $40 a month. And here is what comes with the premium membership if you sign up for it on my website, twominutetennis.net from now until tomorrow night once the Super Bowl ends. You've got until the Super Bowl ends to sign up. If you do sign up, then you get a free Zoom private lesson that comes with the membership. That's normally $120. That's where you and I meet live on Zoom and I fix your technique, your strategy, your footwork, your backhand, your forehand, yada, yada. I'm going to answer that question, by the way. I'm going to answer the, is the hip power source on the, oh, you know, the hips, the power source on the forehand or backhand. I thought you were talking about on the serve. So we'll talk about that as well. But if you would like me to personally teach you how to improve your game, Go to twominutetennis.net, pick up a premium membership. It's $40 a month, cancel anytime. I'll teach you weekly in a members group live class, Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. and Eastern Standard Time. If you can't make the class each week, no problem. I've always put the recording up on the website for the members to view. You get, you earn a free Zoom lesson with me when, when you sign up immediately uh, between now and the end of the Super Bowl, which I don't know, is like 30 hours from now. Uh, you get my mastery courses. You get a 50% off coupon code on any Zoom lesson or stroke analysis that you get. I'm so excited. Uh, and we're picking up members every day. So it's super fun. All right, let's talk about hip rotation on the forehand and backhand. And then let's talk about the serve. The serve and the hip rotation uh, or the hip movement. I did a video on Ben Shelton's serve. And... The, the Ben Shelton serve is one of the best examples, and then, and then I'll talk about it on the ground stroke. The Ben Shelton serve is one of the best examples of getting your butt to stick forward. You might see here, I've got green painter's tape, if you know what I mean by green painter's tape. You know that green frog tape? I put some frog tape on the ground to make a, 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 a baseline. But when you're serving, you know, people always talk about the hip. Don't jet your hip out. Don't put your hip out stick your butt, stick your butt cheek into the court. Because that's really what's happening. See how it looks like I'm sticking my hip out, but really it's my butt cheek. And that means I'm coiled and then I can uncoil. So don't stick your hip out, ouch. Stick your butt and be coiled and then uncoil. And you'll finally feel that like corkscrew uncoiling as you go to hip. Now, when it talks to or when it comes to turning the body, 
on a forehand or backhand. We're going to talk about it as a forehand, a backhand, two-hander, and a backhand one-hander. Let's talk about the forehand. When you are turning the body to hit, it is really important that you use your non-hitting hand as a mechanism for helping that occur. What you do not want on the forehand is that this hand stays here. So if you are working on firing the hips as you hit the ball, if you're working on flipping the rack and having a pre-stretch like Fetter, what I want you to focus on is not so much your hips. I want you to focus on your non-hitting hand. So when you take the racket back, take it back with it on the racket. And then as you begin the drop and you let go with the non-hitting hand, I want your non-hitting hand visible over your non-hitting shoulder from the back view at contact. So turn with both hands and uncoil, and this hand should be here. There are many videos on YouTube of coaches trying to help players uncoil their hips because the player is doing this. The player is hitting forehands and they're doing this. They're making this move. And the coach is correctly saying, you need to turn the hips. The problem though is the non-hitting hand. The non-hitting hand should be going forward as the racket goes down. Now watch this, I'm gonna move my racket down and I'm gonna move my non-hitting hand forward. Watch how those happen at the same time. See my non-hitting hand going forward as the racket drops? If you do not have that, you will not turn your hips. So when you take the racket back, take it back with both hands, and then your non-hitting hand clears out of the way as the racket drops. And what I tell people is, wave to your opponent as you are striking the ball. Wave to your opponent at contact. When you look at Djokovic hit a forehand from the front view, it looks like he's waving to the opponent. In fact, you can actually say that there is a correlation between the level of the player hitting the ball and the level of their, or the height of their non-hitting hand. So the higher the non-hitting hand, the higher the level of play. The lower the, the height of the non-hitting hand, the lower the level of play, because it really makes or breaks your ability to turn your hips. Let's talk about this on the two-handed backhand, because on the two-hander, I love how you're all talking to each other. You're all being so nice to each other. I love it. On the two-hander, one of the biggest problems when it comes to turning our hips, and if you have not hit the like button, it would mean the world to me if you did right now. Thank you so much. One of the biggest problems with hip turning isn't if somebody turns their hips, it's that they do it too late. So the perfect example of turning the hips at the right time, Felix Auger Aliassime. FAA does it correctly. He does a unit turn on the way back, and then as the racket drops, he rotates the hips. What you do not want to do is drop the racket and, you have, and, and you're all the way at the bottom and you have not begun hip turn. See, I do a lot of Zoom lessons. Look at that, we're up to 90 likes. I'm, I'm wondering if we can get to 100 before we're done here. We, the Zoom lessons are so telling. A Zoom lesson is where you and I meet live on Zoom. You can purchase them on my website. You also get one free if you sign up for a, a premium membership in the next 30 hours you know, before the end of the Super Bowl. And a, a Zoom lesson allows you to send me videos of your forehand, your backhand, your serve, whatever. And then I put you side by side. I share my screen. I put you side by side. And yesterday, I put one of my students from California side by side with Felix and Djokovic. And I showed him that he was not turning his hips until the bracket got all the way down to the bottom. The proper timing on hip rotation on a two-handed backhand is as your racket drops, your hips turn. So the body and the racket go back together, unit turn, but the body has to turn forward again. But if it waits for the racket to get all the way down, and then you start turning the hips. There's no separation in the body and the racket, which forces the racket drop. Like that's that little bounce you see with Djokovic because the hips are turning. He's not doing this. He's doing this. 
So the hands get pulled forward because the body rotates, but a body in motion tends to stay in motion. So the rack is trying to keep going down. So what compromises is the wrist. And that's when you see this and the racket drops. That's that little bounce you see from Djokovic on the two in a backhand. The racket almost looks like it's bouncing off the ground, which it's not obviously. So you have to film yourself from the back or take a Zoom private lesson with me and I will teach you everything personally. And I'll watch you in your house demonstrating your backhand and I'll demonstrate here. You get the whole thing recorded. The Zoom lessons are amazing. And you have to make sure that you are turning your hips as the racket's dropping. That parlays and creates a kinetic chain where the energy parlays from the body, from the ground, all the way through the arms to the racket, and then you go. Now, when it comes to the one-handed backhand, there is hip turn as well on a one-handed backhand. Now, we know on a one-handed backhand that we are, what we are looking to do is to stay sideways. What we are looking to do as we finish and strike the ball is to stay sideways so that the racket can track out toward the target. So if you are going to be sideways to your target, but you want to rotate the hips, that means you have to turn past sideways initially. Let me show you. Here, if, my, if the wall is my target, I need to turn to 90 degrees and then maybe even 135, which is... 45 degrees past that. I need to be able to turn 45 degrees with my hips. And I'm gonna do the same thing as my racket's dropping, I'm turning my hips just like the two in a backhand. But I turn my hips to 90 and then it stops and then I stay sideways. If you are currently struggling with power on your one-handed backhand, if you are currently struggling with power on your one-handed backhand, it may be that you are not utilizing a hip turn into the shot because you are getting to sideways. If you are at 90 degrees, there's no hip turn. You're just gonna swing from your arm. But if you can turn past that, you watch Gasquet. Gasquet, he hits like all of his backhands like this. He'll step, he'll step back to get in this position. Why? Because he's trying to get his hips to turn more than 90 degrees so we can rotate into it and then be sideways as he's done. So turn your hips past 90 degrees, almost feel like you're gonna turn your back to your opponent, you're gonna turn your back butt cheek to your opponent and then rotate your hips to contact, but then stay sideways, you separate the arms and the racket tracks out towards your target. I saw somebody uh, say, Ryan, okay. Uh, I struggle finishing points on mid-court floaters. I screw up the spacing every time and usually push it long, any tips? Absolutely, and this is gonna be my last question that I answer. Guys, we're only five likes away from 100. I don't know if I've ever gotten 100 likes on a live. You would make my weekend. Well, the Eagles winning the Super Bowl would make my weekend. Let me show you why players struggle dealing with high floaters, those mid-week, mid-court balls. And the reason uh, is because of spacing. So. Here is something that can be a mind-blowing experience, right? We're at 98, we're at 98. I cannot wait to see that get to 100, 100 likes. You have to stand farther away. 100, perfect, love it. Congrats, guys, thank you so much. You did that, not me. I, I can't push my own you know, like button, so thank you so much. The key to dealing with a ball that is a mid-court ball is to stand farther away from the ball than you typically do. Here's why. As your racket rises, it also gets farther away from you. So watch this. If I lower my racket, it gets closer to my leg. As I raise my racket, it gets farther away from me. You know, the, a three on a clock is more to the right than the six, right? It's not just higher, it's more to the right. That's because the hands on the clock, it's a radius. So what happens is players on the high ball, they stand the same distance away from the ball as they typically would if the ball were here. But the problem is, as the contact point rises, you have to stand farther away from the ball. The ball that you will stand the farthest away from will be a ball that is played at head level. Now you might be saying, but Ryan, wait a minute. 
Wouldn't it be shoulder level? Because the hand would be level to the shoulder? It's like, no, because at this point, when you contact the ball, you're actually playing the ball with your racket above your hand. It's a very weak wrist position to be like this. The strength is with the racket above the hand. So when the head of the racket is the same as your head, that's when your hand is at shoulder level, and that's when you're playing the farthest away from the ball. So if you all want to be better at playing a ball at head level, you know those weak balls where you come in and you're gonna use an open stance, you're gonna sit down and you're gonna blast that ball. If you're right-handed and the ball is here, move away from it. Start standing so much farther away from that ball and you'll have a lot more success. You, the person said who asked that question, I'm dealing with spacing issues. I'm dealing with spacing issues. Yeah, no, nothing worse than losing a Super Bowl when you should. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, a point when you should. Guys, thank you so, so much. That Was that for you slip? Thank you so much. I really appreciate you uh, trusting me to help you with your tennis game. I love doing these Instagram live, I'm sorry, YouTube lives. I just got an Instagram notification, so I read it. <laughs> um, uh, the Instagram live, I go live on Instagram every, yeah, you got it, Maker, thanks so much. I, I go live on Instagram every day, New York City time from like 3 to 3.30. I'm always in my car because I'm waiting for my kids to get out of school. Um, and But I'm going to try to do more of these Saturday things where I come live for an hour. Uh, but guys, please, if you would like me to personally fix your technique, your, I, like tomorrow morning, for instance, I have a lesson tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., my time. He's in Italy, so it's probably like 1 o'clock in the afternoon for him, uh, 12 o'clock. I have a Zoom lesson live with a guy in Italy, and he's a coach, and he filmed himself playing a match. Yeah, you got it, Steven. And I'm going to be reviewing his footwork, his technique, his strategy, his split step, his tactics, his spacing, his core position. Uh, I absolutely cannot wait for that. And that's what the beauty of the Zoom lessons are. So if you would like me to personally fix your technique and put you side by side with the pros, just like you watch on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube here, then go to twominutetennis.net right now and sign up for the premium membership because between now and the end of the Super Bowl, which will probably be 11 o'clock, 1030 at night, uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday, uh, Sunday night, uh, New York City time, I have a deal where if you become a member for $40 a month, cancel any time, not only do you get weekly classes, live Zoom classes where I'm watching you demonstrate and you're watching me, it's all on different topics, they're awesome. You get the recordings of those if you can't make them live. You get 50% off discounts off my Zoom lessons and stroke analysis. You get my mastery courses. But between now and the Super Bowl and the end of the Super Bowl, you get a free Zoom lesson, which is typically $120. So it's I'm I just absolutely am committed to changing the way people learn tennis. Because the tennis court, in my opinion, eh, it's not the greatest place to learn. It's the best place to practice. It's really not the best place to learn. Video, live video, watching you versus the pros, putting your serve side by side with Kyrgios, taking you step by step by step, giving you a complete game plan and drill progression to go through these Zoom lessons. And those of you who've ever taken one, it's 10 times better than any in-person lesson where you don't remember what you said or what the coach said. You don't, you know, you can't learn everything. So you're paying all this money where a Zoom lesson, I can teach you everything you need to learn, looking at your footwork, your match play, your technique, your volleys, your serve, your backhand, whatever. And the whole thing's recorded. The whole thing is recorded. An hour, probably even a half an hour after, after your lesson, I send you a Dropbox link of the entire class. So you get to watch it again and again. People send me videos of them practicing the drills. That's part of the lesson. And I respond back to them. It's just absolutely phenomenal. So thank you also. I've been using video on my tennis since 99. It's been so beneficial. You are 100% right, LeBeau. So thank you all so much. I cannot wait uh, to help you all uh, as part of the Two Minute Tennis tribe and the Two Minute Tennis premium membership. I'll talk to you all really soon. And go Eagles. Thanks, everyone.